purpose. Please welcome Sierra. Thanks so much, Matt. I'll begin this year's talk with a rather hefty question. How is it exactly that the sources that, from history that fill our shelves come to be in our collections? The answer is actually rather simple. Most often it's because someone took the time to recognize the value of a story and then gave us a call. Something tugged at them, compelling them to reach out and offer a collection of unique items that provides firsthand insights into history. In far fewer instances, we have the privilege of actively pursuing a story from multiple angles for the archives. This is a core facet of archival work that often gets overlooked by researchers and casual visitors alike who use our collections. Today, I have the honor of sharing insights into how we are proactively documenting the advent of accessible public transportation in Allegheny County. I assure you, it is a fascinating story. How did we hear of it to begin with, you might ask? Well, that's a great tale in and of itself. So I'll be pulling on these two threads that naturally overlap and intertwine with this presentation. They are, number one, the history of accessible transportation in our region, and number two, how we are collecting the sources that document this story in real time. A bit of background to start. For the past seven years, we've had, the we've had the honor of collaborating with the Western Pennsylvania Disability History and Action Consortium, whose logo of the seat of Pennsylvania with the Western side highlighted in yellow is on this slide, to proactively preserve numerous firsthand stories that centered disabled folks' ongoing fight for human and civil rights in our region. This has been an unparalleled opportunity to preserve local disability history. Notably, many of the collections that have surfaced in this partnership are derived from individuals with disabilities. They also frequently shine a poignant light on the discrimination faced by generations of disabled people. It is through the consortium that we first learn of the region's prestigious place in accessible transportation history, and the integral role that disabled advocates played in this, in this narrative. <clears throat> I distinctly recall the first time consortium member Holly Dick lifted the veil on the significance of this history. I'll never forget my total ignorance, having never questioned the story behind the access paratransit vehicles zooming across our county, or the sound of Pittsburgh regional transit buses lowering for easier boarding. As Holly generously went over an incredible collection of photographs, documents, scrapbooks, and objects that formed her and her husband Paul's history, remarkable narratives emerged. Holly shared with me that she and Paul fell in love while in graduate school in the 1960s at Pitt. At the time, the city they encountered put up obstacles to them with its lack of accessible buses, curb cuts, and other architectural barriers. Neither of the two, though, were bashful about getting involved as members of the disability community. Holly was diagnosed with a visual impairment during her childhood, and Paul recovered from polio as a teenager, using a wheelchair for the remainder of his life. The two of them are depicted on this slide in front of a 1966 Chrysler Newport, which was adapted for Paul's use. In first sharing her husband's story, Holly showed a light on the unique collaborative effort that culminated in the establishment of a paratransit system that was accessible to disabled people decades before the establishment of the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. Try as she might to the contrary, Holly also humbly and rather begrudgingly revealed the integral role that she also played in this history as well, but more on that later. I immediately began wondering where we find where we might find more archival documentation on this subject. So the hunt for additional primary sources began. Before I continue to pull on this thread, however, let's take a step back and set the historical scene for those of you who, like me, were totally unaware of this history. Until the late 1970s, people with physical disabilities and other mobility challenges patently did not have access to public transportation in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. This encapsulated more than 30,000 people, according to an estimate um, from the early 1980s. This meant that there were no public buses with lifts or hydraulics to accommodate people with mobility challenges, and there were no public paratransit vehicles that could transport people in the comfort of their own wheelchairs. 
This stark reality meant that folks like Paul Dick had to resort to travel by taxi, which was expensive, uncomfortable, and at times unreliable. Additional insights into this heartbreaking revelation arrived at the archives on a flash drive. When the consortium learned of our interest in accessible transportation history, Tina Calabro, founder and former director of the consortium, worked with Holly to facilitate the donation of a key building block in this larger narrative, a collection of oral histories donated by former paratransit service employee, Robert Schmidt. Here I'd like to play a clip from Schmidt's oral history with Paul Dick about just how bleak things were in Pittsburgh for disabled folks hoping to get around the city through the 1960s. This process made me realize how difficult it was. We were giving a promise to people uh, there, there was, you know, there were committees at the state and federal level on employment of the handicap. There was a considerable amount of work being done uh, at the time by uh, them uh, about hiring the handicap. It was good business. Uh, BVR was, was pretty active at that point and had started to take people who had more severe disabilities. Uh, and the there were accessible schools. Uh, a lot of uh, things were starting to become accessible in the community. But the one thing that wasn't there was a way to get from A to B. And that be, seemed to be you know, the, the big uh, item that was, that was uh, critical uh, for anyone with a uh, serious mobility disability to take advantage of any of those opportunities. You had to be able to get there. There are definitely instances in which we archivists benefit from the efforts of enterprising individuals who recognize history unfolding before them and get to work, at times nudged by anniversary celebrations, as is the case with Robert Schmidt. Bob sat down with key advocates in order to explore the history of accessible transportation in the region. Holly and Paul Dick were both interviewed. Paul's insights were particularly illuminating. His recollections revealed that the, the story of accessible transportation in Allegheny County started with an innovation directly from the disability community. This is where the story gets even more incredible. In 1970, members of the disability community created Magic Carpet Transportation Service. I love the name. Magic Carpet was a consumer-operated, nonprofit paratransit service for people with disabilities in Allegheny County and was one of the first, if not the first, paratrans paratransit services in the country established by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. Funded by local and state grants, and in Paul's words, kept together by chewing gum and bailing wire, this service consisted of what became a fleet of accessible vans that could be booked by people with disabilities to ensure safe and reliable door-to-door -door transportation as needed. As I dug into its history further, I soon discovered that the University of Pittsburgh's archives and special collections held the records of the organization that established Magic Carpet, known as Open Doors for the Handicapped, or ODH. Naturally, I had to go in to dig into these sources to surface more about this story. There were monthly newsletters and meeting minutes that revealed how this community-born solution contained design features that were highly valued by its writers and totally novel. Importantly, the lift-equipped van enabled people to be transported in the comfort of their own wheelchairs, with the drivers providing door-to-door -door assistance. Founders also knew the importance of making the service affordable. Fares were at least 25% lower than taxi travel. Customers could schedule rides for any purpose and to any destination within the service area. Magic Carpet started small, but it expanded to six vans and had provided over 85,000 rides by 1977. I remain convinced that Magic Carpet in and of itself is a remarkable piece of history, but it's far from the end of the story. As Magic Carpet grew, congressional forces worked to propel further, further change. In 1973, the federal government passed the Rehabilitation Act, Section 504 of which stipulated that those public institutions, including federal agencies, public universities, and public transportation systems, receiving federal funds for their services could not, could no longer discriminate against people with disabilities. That meant that the Port Authority was officially on notice to create an accessible transportation system here in our county. Now, Paul and Holly mentioned in their oral histories 
the creation of an advisory group that was intimately involved in shaping the public transportation system that came to be as a result of this legislative mandate. But for me, the exact role and contributions of this group were still ambiguous. To uncover the next chapter of this narrative, Holly directed me to Irvin Rosner, a figure who was intimately involved in the early history of paratransit in Allegheny County. <clears throat> Irvin was pivotal in helping me understand the nitty gritty of the region's paratransit history. He and his wife, Johanna, graciously hosted Holly and me in their backyard in Squirrel Hill during the summer of 2020. Speaking at a social distance through our masks, Irvin generously sat for an oral history interview. Irvin's work with transportation began when he was a PhD student at CMU. While seeking a dissertation topic, he got connected with CMU's Urban Systems Institute and began studying barriers that seniors and elderly people faced with public transportation. He explained that through initial momentum from CMU's Urban Systems Institute, conversations started in the mid 1970s to create a model paratransit system that coordinated rides for elderly people and people with disabilities between pre-existing transportation providers. It was around this time that CMU partnered with the Port Authority, now known as Pittsburgh Regional Transit, and the Southwestern Pennsylvania Regional Planning Commission, now known as the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission, to provide funding for the Department of Transportation and, or to pr pursue, excuse me, funding from the Department of Transportation and the Urban Mass Transportation Administration to create this coordinated paratransit system. This trans transit system, today known as ACCESS, would become the largest of its kind ever attempted in the world, unique in its approach of partnering with pre-existing for-profit and non-for-profit transportation providers, such as taxi companies. One of the non-profit transportation providers that formed a part of Access was Magic Carpet. And on this slide depicts Allegheny County divided up into different service areas, according to the various transportation providers that participated in the new paratransit system in 1979. <laughs> Records from ODH reveal that key figures from Magic Carpet, such as Paul Dick, Ruth and George Brenio, Edna, Edna Anish, Eileen Shackleton, and Lucy Sproul worked alongside planners with the Port Authority, CMU, and the Southwestern Pennsylvania Regional Planning Commission to shape this accessible transportation system. What still amazes me is the proactive and seminal inclusion of these community stakeholders with disabilities in the planning process that created public paratransit. The firsthand insights that people with various disabilities and elderly people provided in, to, this, um, to this committee definitely shaped the paratransit system that resulted. As a result, elements from uh, nonprofit providers such as Ma Magic Carpet the Magic Carpet operation became hallmark features of the paratransit service created through this partnership. These included door-to-door -door service, affordable fares, unrestricted trip purposes for riders, and the comfort of being transported while seated in your own wheelchair. One of the features most valued by paratransit riders was the lack of restriction on trip purposes. During our interview, Irvin relayed a few hilarious stories to drive this point home. He frequently noted that elderly folks really appreciated the fact that they could book paratransit to go and play bingo on a weekly basis. The Irvin also relayed a story in which someone called a plane to him because they saw an access vehicle on Liberty Avenue in front of a massage parlor. <laughs> and Rosner's response was, it's public transportation. We are not putting restrictions on where people want to go as long as it's within the service area. And Liberty <laughs> Avenue and those massage parlors was within the service area. <clears throat> So next, Holly connected me with yet another person to hunt down images um, that related to Access's history. Um, I do want to backtrack and, and, and describe that depicted on this slide were key figures that implemented Access when it launched in March 1979. They include, from left to right, Bill Millar, Irvin Rosner, Edna, Ainge, Edna Anish, and Tom Letke. This image and several other photographs from Irvin were excellent additions to the archives and marked the first visual material that documented this history. Despite this, I still sought additional images of disability advocates forging accessible transportation history. So as I said, Holly next connected me with yet another person to hunt down additional images and resolve any lingering questions that I have. 
This person was Karen Hesch, current executive director of Access. Karen has worked for the transportation provider since 1979 and is encyclopedic in her knowledge of the evolution of access as features. Karen clarified and drove home the integral role that disability advocates played in shaping the key characteristics of access. She also clarified for me the role of taxi companies in investing in accessible vehicles and committing to have their drivers trained on how to best support their disabled and elderly riders. It was in conversation with Karen that the features of access came into even sharper focus. Meaningfully, Karen also facilitated the donation of useful early reports, grant applications, and photographs that document the early history of this first of its kind paratransit system. It was the collection of photographs from Karen that really blew me away. For as much as I'd gathered rich text and audio-based documentation of local transportation history, there was still a dearth of photographic documentation in the archives of this movement. That changed with Karen's donation. My favorite of these images that she donated depicts local transportation advocates such as Eileen Shackleton, Ray Smith, as well as Ruth and George Breno marching in a parade to celebrate a local Paralympian and to advocate for accessible transportation funding. Here are the images that I had been searching for that I knew could be used in exhibits, publications, and presentations to illuminate this fascinating history. Today, Access remains a national model for paratransit services that provides 1.5 million rides annually in Allegheny County. I just wanna to pause to emphasize the scale of this, 1.5 million rides. Despite the rich array of sources and information that I've highlighted for you today, there still remain additional storylines and individuals to pursue. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention and thank Jeff Parker and Paul O'Hanlon for their valuable insights on the topic as well. We also have had the honor of accepting collections related to Kathleen Kleinman, Jonathan Robeson, and Lucy Sproul, all accessible transportation advocates whose materials provide glimpses into their activism. As I hope you've seen, with each additional generous individual to whom I spoke, there followed an expansion and depth to the historical record of local accessible transportation history. In a simple yet profound way, there is an inextricable link between the sources that are preserved in an archives and the extent to which a story can be understood and shared. Without the generosity of Holly Dick, Tina Calabro, Bob Schmidt, Irvin and Johanna Rosner, and Karen Hesch, our archival cupboard would be bare on this topic. Even more concerning though, is the fact that we would also likely be totally unaware of the significant piece of Western Pennsylvania history without these people. This really underscores the importance of community members in illuminating and preserving local history. I wanna formally thank Holly Dick, Karen Hesch, Bob, Bob Schmidt, Tina Calabro, Irvin and Johanna Rosner, and the Western Pennsylvania Disability History and Action Consortium. Without their generosity as well, uh, Without the generosity of their time and the donation of source material, this presenta presentation and future research on this topic just would not be possible. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sierra.